Well, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, lecture uh, sponsored by the Hedelic Society. We're very pleased to have you here. Uh, my name is Julie Crossman, I'm the president of the Hedelic Society. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Julie Keatman, who is an honorary fellow of Birkbeck College at the University of London. Uh, she's also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and she's a prolific author. It's, I think it's fair to say she usually writes about love rather than war, or at least sex <laughs> rather, rather than war. Um, she's written a large number of books uh, about um, uh, well, everything, really, uh, in, in, in the history of sexuality, including some notorious uh, ladies such as Emma Hamilton and um, uh, Peg Plunkett. Uh, uh, Irish prostitute, um, but above all, she has uh, fallen in love with the island of Leros, mm -hmm. and uh, since uh, since first visiting there, she's developed this great interest in this little-known theatre of war in World War Two. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the topic of her latest book, Hitler's Island of War: Men Who Fought for Leros. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I hope I'm going to make you this worthwhile for you. Um, I'd like to thank the um, Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies, or the Hellenic Society, as I think you call yourselves, um, for inviting me here, um, particularly Judith and Helena um, and Margaret for organising things. Um, my ultimate gratitude, um, however, goes to the British soldiers who told me their stories about what it was like in the Battle of Leros. Many of them are now dead, unfortunately. Um, they left us a legacy of the Battle of Leros, which we'll never forget. This is the subject of, of, the, um, of the book and of, of this event tonight, and I hope I've done them justice in my book. So... Um, if I can just read you what I've got in the flyleaf of the book, which gives you an idea of what um, this is all about. In September 1943, at the height of World War II, the Greek island of Leros became the site of the most pivotal battle of the Dodecanese campaign, as the British tried in vain to retain control of the island. From the Italian capitulation of the 8th of September 1943 to the end of the Battle of Leros, on the 16th of November, thousands of British, Italian and German men lost their lives and thousands more ended up in prisoner of war camps. This is, is the story of some of the men who survived. So the first question, I suppose, is where's Laros? Um, I don't know how many people here um, know about where Laros is. Um, we've got Athens here and we're right down here. So it's quite near the Turkish coast. Um, it's part of the Dodecanese island um, and it's next to Kalimnos and about two islands up from Kos. The second question I get asked most frequently is how I got involved with such a project and why did I start a book about it? My connection with Leros started by sheer chance. I landed in Leros in August 1975 at the age of 17. The Turks had invaded Greek Cyprus the previous year, and war had ensued. The Greek Junta had fallen at the same time, making a trip to Greece a more favourable prospect. I landed with a small knapsack, suntan lotion and a sense of adventure. I had no idea that this would change my life. On first seeing Leros in 1975, I dreamt of having a place of my own on the island, and I eventually bought a tiny run-down cottage in 2001. That was the beginning of my obsession with the subject of the Battle of Leros. However, something had happened before then, which must have embedded itself in my memory. It was on my 18th birthday I walked into the British cemetery, the war cemetery um, in Leros. <coughs> I saw all these graves of young men, the same age as I was, with no life in front of them as I then hoped for. I knew nothing of the Battle of Leros, nor what part it played in the war, 
only that all these men had died fighting for a, a, an ideal of democracy which they held dear. The fact that I shared this ideal bridged the time and space between us. These young men and others of their generation had died fighting for the country during the war when my parents had still been teenagers themselves and made it possible for me to live my life as I was doing then. The memory of that birthday must have stayed with me and it's those feelings that induced me to write this book. Hitler's Island War is the story of the British soldiers who fought for Laros during the battle and this is 75, the 75th year anniversary um, to uh, this year. It tells tales of desperation and horrors of war but also of great courage not just the soldiers themselves but of the Laros Islanders. As Winston Churchill said if it were not for the bravery of the Greeks and their courage the outcome of World War II would be unde undetermined. I would add if not for the bravery of the British soldiers people might have lost hope. The Italians had been already occupying Laros since 1912 they were well positioned all over the Dodecanese island by the time of World War II. They'd been holding the island for the Axis for the first few years of the war. Then, with the surrender of the Italians to the Allies on the 8th of September 1943, the Dodecanese campaign began. This is Laos with its, its castle and obviously Churchill on the right. Churchill had hoped to rush in and defend the islands before the Germans got there but most of the war effort was being focused on the invasion of Italy. Eisenhower wanted no diversions. Churchill knew, therefore, that the job in defending the Dodecanese had to be done on a shoestring, with whatever he had at hand. Churchill sent a letter to General Ismay, who was the link between Churchill and the war's chief of staff. On the 2nd of August 1943, he wrote, can anything be done to find a modicum of assault shipping without compromising the main operation against Italy? It does not follow that troops can only be landed from armoured landing crafts, provided they are to be helped by friends on shore, a different situation arises. Surely kayaks and ships' boats can be used between ships and shore. I hope the staffs will be able to stimulate action, which may gain immense prize at little cost, though not at little risk. The answer was to bring in the special forces. And this is a picture of them um, training in the desert. The formation of the Special Operations Executive consisted of different branches. First, there was the Intelligent Force, then there was the Special Air Service, or the SAS, and the Special Boat Section, later to become the Special Boat Squadron, or the SBS. This was a conscious cost, uh, a, a conscious effort to form a union of forces to create maximum havoc for the enemy at minimum cost and resources. These developments played a significant part in the fighting in Greece and its islands from as early as 1940. Their methods were not to attack in force as an army unit, but to raid undetected as far as poss possible and lay bombs. And this has already been done to great effect in Crete and, and, and Rhodes some, some years earlier. The job of the men was to undertake subterfuge behind enemy lines, blowing up airports, harbours and generally causing mayhem and disruption. All of these men already had excellent track records in the Middle East and would prove expert in the task of sabotage, fighting and rescuing in the Dodecanese Islands. Both the SBS and the Long Range Desert Group had undergone rigorous training in the Middle Eastern um, Desert in preparation for the Do Dodecanese campaign. They had trekked over mountains carrying heavy backpacks and designed special equipment for their actions. This is David Lord Owen, who was the commander of the Long Range Desert Group, um, and, and then training again in the desert. The Long Range Desert Group were mainly made up of New, New Zealanders, at least the ones who went to Laros. They had a good working relationship with a special boat squadron. Lloyd Owen recalled his time in May 1943, training at the Cedars in Lebanon. The aim was to get his men as fit as possible. He recalled, We made long and arduous marches, carrying 60 and 70 pound packs. We passed nights out in the hard and cheerless snow. 
We struggled with teams of bucking, obstinate, hateful mules and sat daily trying to master the intricacies of the Greek or German languages. And all the time we were getting fitter. And we became daily more able to traverse the mountains in fog, in cloud, in blizzard and under the fierce sun. However, Eisenhower refused to give any air cover, which was to be one of the major impediments of the battle. Bombing would happen from noon until night and was to wear down the most hardened of the soldiers. A top secret telegram was sent to the commanders in chief from Chiefs of Staff Middle East on the 15th of September, relaying a message from Eisenhower. We agree that with the resources at present at your disposal, action you are taking the Aegean to exploit Italy's capitulation is best possible. It is desirable on political grounds that you should, if operationally possible, include some proportion of Greek troops in forces used for the occupation of the Dodecanese when opportunity occurs. We appreciate that you would probably wish to support Greek rebels and encourage civilian morale in Greece by infiltration of small special units and by bombing of particular targets. You will realise, however, that any such action could only be carried out at present with resources at your disposal. But we understand that you are already proceeding with the formation and training of these small specialist units in order to be ready for any opportunity that arises. On the eve of the public announcement of the Italian capitulation, there was already a bleak outlook for Greece, despite the optimism of its people. The Times on the 7th of 1943 reported from Smyrna on destitute Athens. According to reports reaching here, the morale of the Greek people, stiffened by their allied victories and by the hope of an early deliverance, is higher than ever, but the physical strain resulting from the scarcity of food and other hardships is again becoming alarming, especially on the Greek mainland and on the islands near to Greece. The black market was rife. Prices had reached astronomical levels for meat and fuel. People reduced to selling off their homes, furniture, jewellery and clothes in order to buy basic necessities. However, the most significant development in the war for the Greek islands was now about to take place. On Laros and neighbouring islands, civilians were also starving. When I first went to um, Laros, <coughs> one of the old ladies, my neighbours, were telling me that they had no food at all to eat and they were reduced to um, picking garlic and what they call horta, which is like a, 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 a weed, a green weed, which is all they had to eat. So, um, the race was now on for Laros between the Germans and the British to see who'd first get to the Dodecanese. The first person to arrive was, um, uh, this was after the Italian surrender, was Captain George Jellicoe, leader of the Special Boat Squadron. Moving into Laros, J Jellicoe had no inkling of what he might find there, and he was adjusting his plans as he went. His initial idea was to make contact with the Italian governor there, Admiral Luigi Mascherpa, with the aim of getting him to surrender the island to the British. And these are the sort of um, kayaks that we used for um, wreckies between the islands um, for undercover operations. One of the men employed by the British agents in the Deccanese who I interviewed was Nikos Pyrovalikis, um, and he, he's still living on Laros, he's 96. He'd been working in covert operations with the SBS during the war since 1941, transporting signalers and agents between the Dodecanese islands, Turkey and Cyprus. He worked with a group of other Greek civilians using a private boat under the direction of a British officer of the SBS. The English officer paid him a wage in gold sovereigns and bought him supplies. Every 15 days, the officer came and filled the boat up with everything they needed for the trips – food, biscuits, chocolate and other provisions. Pyro Velakis was one of the many Greek locals employed by the Royal Navy in the service of the British government throughout the war. And he helped undertake most of the covert operations in and around Laros. 
On Jellicoe's arrival, there was a welcome, welcoming committee of Italian officers. He was pleased to find no opposition. He told me, the Italians on the whole were generally very helpful, perfectly friendly, although not necessarily all that efficient. We got a very well, warm welcome from them. As far as the civilians were concerned, he said, I suppose I was the first British officer there, but they were always extremely friendly, like they always were the Greeks. Jellicoe became, his jeep became a, f a familiar sight all over the islands um, as other, other specialist groups moved in. And the next lot of people to move in were the Long Range Desert Group. Um, they were taken by the Greek destroyer Queen Olga from Haifa to Leros, arriving the following day in the middle of an air raid. Major Guy Prendergast had been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and appointed commander of the Long Range Desert Group, and Major Jake Easton Smith was appointed his deputy. The raiding forces were made up of about 200 men from the Long Range Desert Group, 150 men from the SBS and 30 commandos, with Jellico in control and Prendergast as second in command. They had 40mm breeder guns and five coastal defence batteries. Each of the four six-inch naval guns were Italian. Five long-range desert group patrols went to cover the gun batteries, um, mainly to, support the or to, to encourage the Italians to stay manning their post. Once on Leros, Lloyd Owen and his long-range desert group colleagues were placed under the command of the Royal Irish Fusiliers. It was hoped that the Italian soldiers would now, now fight against the Germans. Of the two, 234th Battalion, which was the main battalion that came to Leros, uh, the Royal Irish Fusiliers were the first um, set of troops to land. This is the one, what, uh, Ted Johnson, um, he was one of the men who I interviewed he came in early on the 19th of September 1943 and he recalled as a 21-year-old officer, he said, We had no briefing about Leros. The first intimation we had that we were going to Leros was after we'd already left Haifa on the destroyer. Officers were sent for and we were told by our second-in-command at the time who imparted the information to us that we were going to Leros. And most people said, where the hell's Laros? And what's Laros all about? We had no briefing what, whatsoever on why we were going there or what we'd find when we got there. We had no battle plans. So that's sort of an indication of what's going to happen. This is the uh, officers from the Royal Irish Fusiliers. Um, the Grand Troops, which made up the 234th Battalion, arrived on Laros over the following months and they consisted of four main regiments. First there was the Irish Fusiliers, and they were the first ones to come in, known as the, the, the Foes. Then there was the Queen's own Royal, West, uh, Royal East Kents, known as the Buffs. Um, then there was the King's own, and then there was the Queen's own Royal West Kent. So there's four main regiments. The Durham Light Infantry went to Kos, and the Royal West Kents went to Samos. And on Samos at the time were the Greek Sacred Brigade. Um, basically, the, um, the British Army didn't actually know where the Germans were first going to attack, uh, where or when. During the first few weeks there was an outbreak of fever among the troops, probably malaria caught in Haifa and reaction to sand, black bite, sand fly bites. Some of the men fell ill. For the most part though, men were finding um, shelter for themselves, digging in and ensuring they had enough supplies of food and ammunition for their regiments. Sorry, that's not a very good picture. This is the um, Queen Olga, the, destro uh, the Greek destroyer. Most Larians know of the disastrous attack resulting from the sinking of the Greek destroyer Queen Olga on the 26th of September, September and they take that as the beginning of the battle. Um, this was a magnificent ship used by the Hellenic army um, assisting the British move their troops um, and supplies onto the islands. For Ted Johnson, however, he remembers it was his first fatality on Leros. He told me, My first casualty on Leros was a Greek sailor who was killed on Olga. I helped pull him out of the water 
and he'd been down there for some time, and that was a bit gruesome. The British destroy Intrepid went down the same night. The Greeks and the British were now joined in their determination as common fighters in the battle against the Germans. Once the bombing started, it was to become relentless until the end of the Battle of Leros on, on the 16th of November. On the night of the 23rd of October, east of Kal Kalimnos around midnight, disaster struck with, struck with the sinking of HMS Eclipse, which would bring in supplies to Leros. The ship had hit a mine and went down within three minutes. It was carrying not only vital equipment and supplies for the garrison, but A Company and part of the HQ Company of the Buffs. Private Stanley Froud of the Buffs was on board when the detonation hit the underside of the boiler room, setting the fuel tanks ablaze. The ship immediately took on a heavy list and broke in two, spilling burning fuel into the sea. And this is a painting of the sinking. I, I couldn't get a... Obviously, there was no cameras there, so we've got a painting. Stan recalled... I was standing on deck with my best friend Jack Hawkes and the other boys, and that was it. I didn't know any more. I woke up and all I saw was flames in my eyes and everything was still. My legs were caught in the wires around the boat. My back was towards the edge of the destroyer and as she turned I went down with her. Strangely, it was kind of peaceful. Then I don't know if I kicked or what, but I came to the surface, about a hundred yards from the destroyer. I saw her turn over and the screws, the propellers, were still going down, fast as she went down, speeding down. Of the 200 buffs on board, 134 perished, along with another 119 naval personnel. And this is a map of the island, just to indicate where um, the Brigadier had actually placed the men. Brigadier uh, Tilney arrived on Leros to take charge of the battalion on the 5th of November. Once the uh, enforcements arrived, if I can get to this work to work, oh, no, hang on, that's it. The buffs he placed up here in the north. Uh, Cleavy was a one, part of one of the, the batteries, uh, and this was sort of like the lookout place. Um, Apatichi was another main main area, and a major um, the, the, one of the gun batteries was there. Um, and, and in the centre, mainly, it was the Royal Irish Fusiliers round here. And this was HQ, the headquarters of, of the, arm, of the uh, battalion. And the King's Own were all placed down here. Um, and again, um, there was um, Scumbada here, was a mountain where they had the batteries. This was Lackey, which was the main port. So there's, there's um, um, guns over... Uh, either side of this to prevent anybody coming in and that was the um, guns of Navarone as you probably remember um, were supposedly based on, on guns there but it wasn't actually. <laughs> anyway, Brigadier Tilney um, who'd um, placed the men um, afterwards um, there was a, a, he decided there was going to be a mobile reserve in the north and the, he placed the fortress uh, most sensibly, uh, the headquarters in the centre. However, the lack of transport hindered mobility, and the only heavy anti-aircraft guns were those were left by the Italians, th those six that are pointed out on, on the mountains at various places. By the 5th of November, there were around 2,000 British soldiers ready for action. And this was the morning of the German invasion. Um, on the 6th of November. The first landings were made here in the north um, and here just under the mountains and they didn't expect um, them to attack at the base of mountains because it was so treacherous to get up and very difficult to climb. So the buffs who were here um, were trying to defend the Germans coming in on their landing crafts. Um, and the, the Germans, meanwhile, were making straight up the mountain sides um, and climbing over extremely difficult rocky terrain. There's a couple of other um, attempted landings here in Gorner Bay on the um, west side and another in Blafuti, but they were seen off. 
Leonard Marcelin Gandon. Gander was the war correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, um, the, a newspaper in Britain. He'd gone out to report on the battle when he heard um, it was about to begin, to begin. He witnessed the events and reported back on what he saw. At about 2pm that same afternoon of the 12th of November, there was a parachute drop and nearly 500 German paratroopers came down. He reported... As I watched, fascinated, something white appeared under the fuselage of the leading machine. It bellied out into a great mushroom, beneath which the dark figure of the parachutist looked small and helpless. Then another came and another, fifteen altogether, most with grey parachutes. The first man, who was probably the group leader, had touched the ground before the machine gunners on the sides of Meraviglia had recovered from the paralysing shock of surprise. Then began a wild outburst of firing from the ground till the air was crisscrossed with red tracer dashes spurting from 20 directions. Many of the paratroopers fell to their death on the rocks, in the sea, or were shot down as they fell. Enough survived to make a difference and to join up with those who landed by sea. More um, details are told in my book, um, mainly through the eyes of the British soldiers. It was a time of great confusion, vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and deaths by German sniper fires. This was all going on under constant bombing, no air cover from the Allies and continual breakdowns in communication as lines were cut and men were killed. The Italian soldiers had been caught between the Allies and the Axis. Thousands of them had been abandoned after the surrender on various islands, told by the Italian governor to swap sides in the middle of a war. Having fought for the Germans, they were now told to fight for the British. It couldn't have been easy. For some of them, the war was over and they sang opera. Others were said to have fought bravely by the side of the British. Ashley Martin Greenwood, head of the artillery, artillery division of the Long Range Desert Group, had been put in charge of the Italian gunners. He recalled how all the shots were out of calibration and it was unsurprising they were missing their shots at enemy aircraft, flying over them. He went round the gun emplacements and ensured they were aligned. The first Italian took his shot and just missed. They realigned and he took another shot. It was a direct hit and the plane came down in smoke. A roar of cheering went up and Italians appeared from nowhere full of congratulations. They decided to throw a party and went back to one of their houses, well furnished with carpets and quite luxurious. Women came out of the background to join them and liquor was pulled out. Such was their celebratory spirit. Mm. However, Greenwood said that although this was typical of the southern Italians, the northern gunners were much more hardened and better fighters. One gunner officer, Capitano Cacciatore, from the Italian battery, was regaled for his bravery. He joined uh, brigade headquarters after his guns had been destroyed. When the Germans had begun to ascend one of the mountains, he charged down the hill at them, throwing his hand grenades. When the grenades were finished, he continued firing until his gun was empty. When his gun was empty, he started throwing rocks at the enemy. He lost an arm and was wounded in the face, legs and side. But according to the man reporting this story, he survived and made good progress later. After tremendous fighting on both sides, Brigadier Tilney surrendered the army at about five o'clock on the afternoon of the 16th of November after headquarters were surrounded by German soldiers. And this is Brigadier, Brigadier Tilney after surrendering the island to um, General Muller on the right. All the men I interviewed thought that they said that Brigadier Tilney was not up to the job. They had never actually forgiven him for surrendering the island. In reality, Tilney probably surrendered to save further loss of life. On the 21st of November 1943, Churchill wrote to Anthony Eden, the Foreign Secretary, expressing his sadness at the loss of life and the loss of Leros. No attempt should be made to minimise the poignance of the loss of the Dodecanese, which we had a chance of getting so easily and at so little cost and which we have now lost after heavy expenditure. Meanwhile, General Muller 
took pleasure in having his victories photographed taken with his soldiers in front of Villa Bellini in Alinda in Laros. The villa had been used as a makeshift hospital during the bombing and throughout the battle. Prisoners were assembled there after the surrender. Prisoners were also taken to the harbour of Aya Marina and finally taken to the main port of Porto Largo, uh, which is now known as Lucky. Churchill contemplated that the British had probably downed 2,000 Germans on the way, but the enemy now held 3,000 prisoners of war. He estimated the British losses to be about 5,000 men. The number of injured and dead became evident as the battle drew to a close. The roll call of dead soldiers was high. After fighting on Leros, um, on the left, a Danish soldier, Anders Larsen, lost his life some time later in April 1945 on the shore of Lake Camaccio in northeast North Italy. He'd won three military crosses and for his final battle was the only non-Commonwealth soldier to win a Victoria Cross. During the battle, his dispatches stated he had complete disregard for his personal safety. J. Keeson Smith, Long Range Desert Group, had gone towards Leros Town of Platanos to prevent the enemy moving south. It was the last day of the battle on the 16th of November. He was shot by a German sniper and killed instantly. According to one of his men, he was brave wise with an uprightedness that shamed lesser men and was considered one of the finest men in the Long Range Desert Group. He now lies in Leros Cemetery with his colleague, Alan Redfern. Of Redfern, his captain said, his loss was a great blow as he was much liked and a respected officer. He'd done invaluable work with us. One man I interviewed, Paddy McChrystal, a young private in the Royal Irish Fusiliers, was near to tears when he recalled the loss of his comrades. The commanding officer, we called him Mickey French. His brother, George, was there. He was killed too. McAllister was one of those injured. Jesus wept. Matheson, O'Connell, the two brothers, they were sergeants, all killed. Paddy himself was hit in the head with a large piece of shrapnel, leaving a scar he would bear for the rest of his life. He ended up in the hospital in the prisoner of war camp for three or four months. After the surrender, the SBS and Long Range Desert Group were meanwhile desperately trying to get soldiers off the island. Those who had not captured were struggling to, to escape. They searched for small, blo uh, small boats to take them to Lipsy, the island near Bileros, and onto the Turkish coast. Two of those to escape were Cafford, Captain Clifford Clark and Sergeant George Hatcher. Once in, in Porto Largo in the main harbour, they had to move carefully in case any Germans were patrolling the vicinity, although all seemed clear. They managed to find a small boat Hatcher recalled that it was pitch black as they went out to sea. He said, We went out on the wide open sea. We were wide open for any attack. As we were rowing, we suddenly saw a small German convoy going into the harbour. We all had to sit and hold our breath and stop rowing and hope they didn't see us. Luckily for the handful of men in the boat, the Germans overlooked them. The men eventually made their way to Lipsy, where locals gave them food and shelter and hid them in their houses. A British agent event eventually got them off the island onto a kayak to Turkey. All the British soldiers remember the kindness of the Larians and the locals on Lipsy who helped them escape. Those who could not get off the island ended up in prisoner of war, uh, on cattle trains first of all, from Athens. They were taken from Leros to Athens um, on a boat to Piraeus, marched through, um, through a, 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 what they called a humiliation walk. Um, and eventually put on cat cattle trains um, where they were sent to various detention camps where they stayed until the end of the war. Uh, this photograph was taken in Stalag 7A at Mooseburg and shows the British prisoners of war talking to the new inmates captured on Laros. Every one of the soldiers I interviewed was against the surrender and would have kept on fighting and the German account seems to bear this out. General Muller, in a history of his 22nd Infantry, admitted on the 14th of November, this is still during the battle, it appears to be almost impossible that we should ever win the battle. The destiny of the troops on Leros 
hang on a thin thread. The British magazine The Spectator for November 19, 1943 gave a scathing verdict on the Aegean events in an editorial entitled The Sacrifice of Laros. It said, Public opinion will not be satisfied until the whole question of Kos, Laros and Samos has been cleared up. After days of heroic resistance in which 3,000 British troops and 5,000 Italians received and deserved public admiration for holding on against perpetually reinforced German troops and mass bombing attacks against which there was virtually no protection, we now learn that the inevitable has happened, that the garrison has been overwhelmed and the island lost. 183 British and Commonwealth soldiers lie in Laos Cemetery and 135 uh, mainly buffs drowned in the sinking of the eclipse. The Germans suffered around 1,109 casualties out of 4,500 troops. One source reckons out of 525 Italian officers on, on Laros, about 50 died in combat and 440 were shot by Germans. The British prisoners numbered approximately 3,200 3, men. The Italian POWs numbered approximately 5,350. Reports were heard of the cruel treatment of the Italians by the Germans. The story has long circulated in Leros that at least one full boat of Italian officers that had set out from what Pandeli, one of the small bays, was intentionally scuppered by German fire coming from the shore. For the men who fought for Leros, though, it was to become one of the most significant and certainly the most tragic story of their lives. For those of us who remain, let us remember those who fought so bravely for a democracy we still cherish on the 75th anniversary of the battle. My friend Bob King, a 96-year-old Laros vet veteran, wrote to me today asking us to remember those who died on Laros, quoting this poem. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Thanks. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I wonder if, um, if, if you have a question, you could raise your hand and then we can give you a microphone and then your question can be recorded for all time. Well, that's not quite all time, but for a good long time anyway. Um, they're, they're doing the... Okay. Sheila. Thank you very much, Julie. That's really very well expressed. And it's a difficult, complex situation and hard to understand, really. Um, from my point of view, um, because my subject is Italian history, uh, the Italians didn't really stand a chance on, on roads for example, where they were way outnumbered the Germans, but for numerous reasons they, they knew they weren't going to win. And I just wonder why Churchill, knowing that the Americans were not going to support them, took this risk. I know he's very keen on the idea, while the Americans wanted to invade France and Italy and so forth, and did, um, that he was still hoping to attack via the Aegean. It just seems crazy that they mm. took this this extraordinary risk when they had no air cover. Mm. Um, I'm mystified still. I should know, but I'm mystified. I, I think a lot of the soldiers that I spoke to felt the same, actually. Um, that, um, they, I'm, I'm going to repeat your question for the camera, because um, that's what they asked me to do. Um, why did Churchill um, make the decision to invade uh, to, to defend the islands from um, from the Germans. Um, I think one of the problems as well, um, not just the fact that um, Churchill was thinking, oh, the Italians will um, defend the islands, which must be absolutely impossible in the middle of a war to change sides like that. Um, uh, one of the other problems was that he, he thought that Turkey would come in on, on uh, if we actually won the islands, um, then Turkey would come in as well. Um, so I think he was sort of jumping ahead of himself. Um, I 
think that I think like you do. I think it is quite a mystery. I think he'd had that obsession of uh, of the underbelly, conquering the underbelly of Europe for so long, and part of the um, the reason that he wanted to actually go into um, these islands is because he thought they'd got a chance, at least with the long range desert group and the SPS. Um, but no air, no air cover. With no air cover, but with... Which they knew the Germans had. And so. that was the main Sorry. problem, because Eisenhower wouldn't let the... Um, wouldn't, wouldn't divert any of the, um, the uh, forces from, from the Italian campaign, as you know. Um, and I think a lot of the men thought that, that they'd actually gone on a, a, a bit of a losing battle. So would you say then that, that the surrender did save lives? Because the... I've got the name of the... Brigadier Tilney. Uh, Tilney, yes. Mm. I mean, he's regarded as rather incompetent. Yeah, uh, I, th I think, well, I think he was. But yeah, I think the main problem was that Churchill presumed that the Italians would ch would actually be in full fighting fettle, and they yes. weren't. Some did. Some did. Um, but when I was explaining as well, one of the, the, the men from the Long Range Desert Group was telling me about how the calibration was off. Um, I've since been talking to a film director who's actually done a lot of exploratory work talking to Italians as well and it would seem that some of the Italians were actually deliberately um, misfiring um, because for war, for them the war was over as far as they were concerned. They, they didn't just want wanted to, to go home. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of, um, there was a lot of reports from the men that I interviewed where the men had just abandoned, the Italians had abandoned the post and just hid in caves. Um, and I think Churchill's faith in the Italians was just misplaced. Um, however, um, I do think that there was a fighting chance um, that they, they could have defended Leros at least. Um, and I think what they probably should have done was take more opportunity to get the Sacred Brigade involved because there was at least 3,000 of the Sacred Brigade on Samos, which is just the island further up from Leros. Um, but they, the officers didn't have the trust in the sacred brigade either. Um, and I think if they'd have put their faith in them and had them come, brought out to Laros, there'd have probably been more chance of defending the island. But ultimately, even if they had succeeded in that instance, ultimately the Germans would have won because they had been expecting the Italians to pull out after Mussolini fell mm. and the Allies arrived in Sicily. Mm. They, the Germans were ready mm. to fight um, in Greece, uh, although there was the subterfuge and, you know, they were ready. So, I mean, ultimately, even if they'd won on Leros, the they'd Germans, have probably lost the, the other Germans islands. stayed in the Mediterranean for another year, mm. so they would mm. have lost it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think um, from, from the point of view of my soldiers, they were saying that they would have carried on fighting because that's the sort of metal they were made of. And that's the type of men that they were, and that's the way that they were brought up to fight. Um, but also um, the fact that uh, Mickey F French, Maurice French, one of the leaders, um, was actually a better um, battalion um, officer, and he actually knew how to. He got infantry, uh, much more infantry experience, which Brigadier Tilney didn't actually have, and I think they resented him coming in. Um, and, and overtaking when he hadn't actually got the military, the military background to do it. So it's all a bit of a fiasco. Yeah, but they could have won and it could have been something that would have made everybody much more optimistic and, you know, it could have helped, it could have tipped the balance in some way. The problem was that once Crete had gone and once Rhodes had gone and once we'd lost the airfields, we'd had it really. Um, and that was the big problem. Uh, and if they were going to do it, they should have done it much more effectively in roads while we'd yeah, they'd still got a chance. Done it on roads, but the Germans were much more efficient than the Italians have got there. Well, they'd already, well, they're already there. Because they'd been there for so long mm. and they didn't, mm. they weren't able to fight, really. Mm. Anyway, well done. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Sheila, by the way, is an expert in um, the history of Cyrus. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Is that one in the corner there? Thank you. Two very short questions. One arose from what the lady before me said. 
Χρήστο Δόλ, it is described in the leaflet as the Dodecanese War. And Dodecanese in Greek means 12 islands. Uh, was it only Leros that was involved, or there were another 11 also involved, or some of them, or simply the book is about Leros? This is my first question. The second question, um, you said something about uh, Churchill uh, thought of helping the Greeks because the Turks said that, the, that they would help the British, something like that. I thought that the Turks from the beginning of the 20th century, they were extremely philo-German like um, Lehman von Saunders advised them on ethnocatharsis and everything and he was basically the leader of the Turkish army. Then later in the Balkan Wars, in the First World War, they were extremely philo-German and alongside also with the Aust um, Hung Hungary and Austria. So what made them change, if I understood well, that they changed heart and they sided with the British as opposed to the Germans, the Turks? If I got right your remark when you said that the uh, Churchill actually thought of helping the Greeks because he thought that the Turks would help. And also about the 11 islands, if they were involved. Thank you. Um, first about the 12 islands. Um, yes, it's the 12 islands were involved. Castellariso was one of the first islands um, where the British held ground. Um, but um, there'd already been fighting in Rhodes, as you know, and Rhodes was lost. Um, so, and, and then after the capitulation on the 8th of September, um, the British went to Castellarizo and Kos and Samos um, and spread out around the islands as far as they could, around the Dodecanese. Um, but as, as I was saying, once Rhodes had been lost, we'd lost the only airport, really. Um, and once we'd lost the airport, um, our next air base was Cyprus, and it was too far um, to, to provide air cover. Um, so yes, the, we were on the other islands, um, but once Laros, Laros was one of the main naval bases, which is why they took to defending that so, so well, um, and why it was the main focus. However, once that fell, they pulled out um, all the soldiers from Samos and all the other islands as well. Um, and you could see how the islands were falling from Rhodes and then Kos fell and then Kalimnos fell and then Leros fell. And so before they got to Samos, they pulled all the soldiers out. Regarding Turkey, Turkey was ne neutral. Um, but the, there is evidence that um, Churchill actually had a, a meeting um, with the Turkish Prime Minister. Um, and um, I don't think there was any chance of the, to the Turks from what what for changing sides or, or or. But I think Churchill was hoping that if the Italians showed willing to fight and that they showed that they that the British were winning, that they'd come onto the winning side. But of course, that didn't happen. Of who? The Turkish Prime Minister. Haven't a clue, Sheila. I, 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 I did the Battle of Laros. I'm, I'm, I'm not well. This is my first military history book. I write about sex normally. So. <laughs> I know. No, I don't. How do you know him? No, no, Sheila. No, I with the Germans in the First World War, they were staying out of the, yeah. uh, of the Second World War because they got into trouble, but they tried to be as neutral as possible. Mm. What, they, what we did do is um, the British had um, what they called a rat run um, through Turkey. So when they did the SBS, uh, the Special Boat Squadron, when the islands fell, they helped to get people um, through Lipsy and to the Turkish coast. And then there was, um, we had diplomats in Turkey um, and, and we could actually escape up to um, the Middle East and get out, get out that way. So a lot of soldiers did escape that way. Any other questions? Or should we perhaps thank the speaker again? Oh, no, there's one. Does, <laughs> you, it's yeah, you. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about the Yeah. Could you just tell us a little bit about the, the process of writing the book, and particularly the interviewing of the veterans? So it was very conscious that there are you know, very, very few of that generation left now, and you said yourself, I think, a number of the mm. people you'd interviewed had subsequently passed away. 
So what, what was it, what was that experience like for you? It was absolutely amazing. Um, I get a bit emotional about it actually. It was first of all, it was hard tracking them down um, because um, I, I I I didn't know where to start, and I talked to people on the island, and um, there was two there's two old guys on Laros who had. Um, private war museums and they collected private memorabilia uh, and they collected all sorts of shells and guns and everything you can imagine um, from the war. And they had letters from Leros Vets um, who visited the island and come back. Um, in 1988 there was a reunion of Leros Vets um, and I miss, I miss that. But when I was back, when I bought the house in 2001, I actually met all the, these two blokes who got the um, war museum. And so I wrote to the Laros vets who he got letters from, and it, then they put me into contact with people. They got war diaries. Um, then I was uh, I put um, uh, messages out on regimental sites, um, genealogical sites, and people just... I, I, there's a few people just started contacting. Oh, my dad was there. I'll put you in contact with him. Um, but the interviewing process was amazing. Um, most of them said to, to me that they'd never spoken about it to anybody, not even their wives or their sons or daughters, uh, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Um, and I think one of the reasons that they talked to me um, was because I'm a woman. And people, somebody said to me, it was actually a Greek reporter, said, oh, isn't it amazing, you're a woman doing military history. Um, I kept my mouth shut on the sexism. But what I did say was, um, I think it was because I was a woman, that they actually did speak to me and open up. And they told me things that I don't think they'd have told a man. Um, and they were wonderful. I mean, they were really courteous as well. Really old school, took me out for lunches. You know, the, the, it's not just, wasn't just interviews. It was sort of, it was a bit like a courtship in a way. It was just very strange. It was lovely. It was a lovely experience. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I, I think we really must stop there. Um, we, we, we should reward the speaker not only with our applause, but also with something to drink, I think, at this point. Uh, and uh, thank her very much indeed once again. Copies of the book is the CR available <laughs> purchased. Uh, and uh, there is also wine. So thank, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you for coming.